Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to all of you on the internet and welcome to you folks here in the hall with me. Yes, I am the chair of the Connecticut Coalition Against Bed Bugs. I'm also a bed bug behavior biologist and uh, I have found over the years of research um, a developing respect for the remarkable resourcefulness of this little insect and its intimate relationship with people. And so I'm going to be taking you along in a journey um, to do with the history of the insect, its um, biology, its behavior, and then what you do. So by the time I finish with uh, talking to you this afternoon, I am hoping that every one of you will be an expert and you'll be able to pass along this information to other folks who are interested. I open my talks often with this particular slide, is who would you rather be bitten by? Now, um, I started this about 10 years ago, and generally uh, people would aim for a mosquito as the answer. In fact, all three um, groups, ticks, mosquitoes, or biting flies, and bed bugs, and there are about 95 species of bed bugs that specialize on different animals and creatures around the planet, they all have the same mechanism of feeding. They feed um, by tapping into a bloodstream. They are capitalizing on your hard work. You come to work, you earn money, you go home, you then go to the grocery shop, you buy groceries, you bring it back, you cook the food, and then you eat it. Well, a bed bug doesn't have to do this. He just nips over, takes a quick snack, and off he goes. So bed bugs, uh, ticks, mosquitoes, and many creatures in, across the planet take advantage of other organisms and creatures' hard work by tapping into their blood systems. This is not unusual behavior. Um, so the bed bug of these three is the one that you should be fed on because it does not transmit any human disease-causing pathogens. It is the safest of the three. You should be very concerned with mosquitoes and ticks. This is what happens when people run into bed bugs. This gentleman rented a car in Florida, drove to a parking lot outside a stop and shop grocery store in Long Island, and found that he got bed bugs. He smothered the car in gasoline in the interior and somehow it ignited, taking everything up with it. Um, this is not how you handle the situation with bed bugs. Clearly, he corrected the problem, but he took everything down too. So the take home message, I would say, if any of you have one or need one from this afternoon's session, is that bed bugs are a building problem, not a personal problem. Bed bugs are not um, voluntarily moved from place to place by people. It is totally by accident. Um, this is a cracking crevice living in insect, and buildings are basically man-made caves, providing perfect accommodation for the insect. Uh, they live in these cracks um, for 98% of their lives. They'll nip out for about five to 10 minutes for a feed and then return. So their entire existence actually is living in cracks and crevices of structures and objects. There are two sides to the coin, the human side and the insect side. So we're going to start off with the human narrative. It's going to be a bit of a rough trip here, but this is, this is what is going on. And I'm going to run back into history. Historically, bed bugs were distributed across international uh, trading routes, the ancient spice routes. Um, the insect originated somewhere in northern Africa and the Far East. Of course, we will never know. But um, they eventually, re ancient records um, found the insects to um, populate China. And then in Europe, they tracked um, through the shipping lanes, going up western Italy, southern France, round Spain, western France, and into England, arriving in England in the mid to late 1500s. But they or are always found along trade routes. And this is something you need to remember because I'm going to come back to that shortly. But <clears throat> when I grew up, 
I would hear the saying, night, night, sleep tight, don't let the bed bugs bite. And I had no idea what my parents were talking about because they basically were wiped out by the early 1950s. Um, the bed bugs became a humongous problem in the United States around the um, 1915, 16, 17, 18 period because of the introduction of central heating. Before then, people would often shut down rooms for the winter and keep only a few heated um, because there was no way to keep large spaces warm. It's very difficult. Um, but when central heating came in, it allowed for entire buildings to be comfortably heated. And so what is comfortable for us is comfortable for the bed bugs. And so they thrived. And so there were meetings in Congress in the late 1920s. What are we going to do? Um, I think in 1936, there were well over 3,000 businesses in London alone servicing people for bed bugs. This was a pandemic of insects. Then DDT came along and was released for general use in around 1945. The insect is highly sensitive to this neurological toxin. Um, it can be put into a crack and be active for at least three years. So it was a very easy way of managing the insect. It was incorporated into wallpaper, even crib fabric for the babies. It was everywhere. And if you dig down into the soils, even in Connecticut, you can find DDT even today throughout the entire environment. In fact, in the mid-70s, early to mid-70s, it was banned because it had magnified up through the food chains and was uh, killing off um, top predators and, and uh, many organisms. So it, was, it became environmentally toxic, but it was extremely effective on bed bugs. So by 19, early 1950s, they basically were extirpated from Western industrialized nations. Combined with the advent of household appliances such as the vacuum cleaner and washer and dryer and the simplification of architecture rendering buildings less full of cracks they all conspired for basically wiping out bed bugs completely so what happened to bring them back okay um, a number of things and it really kicked off in the 1990s um, the war on drugs was an issue, and basically that was industrialization of the prison system, and it was striking out at the poor, and in many cases creating pauper's prisons. You know, people would um, be selected if they looked at an officer incorrectly, they could be arrested, then there would be a fine, and if somebody is impoverished, can't pay the fine, they go to jail. And then what happens is they spend some time in jail, they come out, now they can't, they'll have, can't or can't have great difficulty in voting, they can't be part of society, and it's more difficult to get a job because you have a prison record. So it's, 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 it's a tension point because uh, people have been disenfranchised and they are not able to have resources. Um, then another element in this was the establishment of the World Wide Web on August the 6th, 1991. Okay, this offered a free, very efficient way of communicating over great distances, a great, uh, very short periods of time. So large amount of data could say, for, go from New York to Tokyo in seconds. So corporations realized the potential of that mechanism. And then in the 90, early 1990s, um, NAFTA, the uh, North American Free Trade Agreement, came through, and the opponents argued that it would uh, launch a race to the bottom in wages, destroy hundreds of thousands of good U.S. jobs, undermine democratic control of domestic policymaking, and threaten health, environment, and uh, food and safety standards. All right? Basically, it did that. And then in 1999, the Glass-Siegel Act um, was repealed where commercial banks uh, could gain uh, engage in investment uh, banking industry so the economics the finance was freed you had this international communication system which was the internet and then you had free trade so corporations could then move jobs overseas particularly to the far east and the philippines let me just back up okay 
So that's the setup. And then we had the economic collapse in 2008. As a scientist, I started to see bed bugs coming into my office in the early 2000s, about 2000, 2002, 2003. And then the numbers jumped after that, and I couldn't figure out what was going on. Why are we getting all these bed bugs? Well, this is what is happening. If you look at these graphs, uh, you can see intense movement of goods and shipping um, across the world at high speed. So these ships, who are massive, uh, can move goods around the world. And with that, I started to notice um, buildup of bed bug populations at uh, ports, shipping ports. And so you can see an example of a very dark line on the lower panel um, with an arrow pointing to Sao Paulo. And then you see the cluster map above with a very large red spot of reporting of high numbers of bed bugs at these shipping ports. So international trade, international communism and capitalism open pipelines of movement for these insects to come back into Western industrialized nations. And uh, with that, the population moved into the more impoverished areas where people are not equipped and don't have the resources and education to handle the insect. And so they're back. And I have never been busier. I average six to eight calls a day on bed bugs from, from all across the country. So they're ubiquitous um, and they're all over the world. This was a cluster map done in 09. Those red dots would be right across the planet. So there is economic disparity that, and the military industrial complex. Insects are being moved around the uh, world very easily um, in the uh, military system. Um, and so we have this, 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 this schism, this, this social stress. And so the insect is nested between the twin peaks of debt and idle money. So it's, it's a it's social commentary. So we go now over to the insect side in the narrative. It is considered a parasite. Um, one study said that about 63% of biomass, even in an estuary, has some kind of parasitic behavior capitalizing on somebody else. And you can see uh, parasite manipulation, and the uh, bed bug is certainly very good at that. Um, here's examples of parasites. Um, there is a tapeworm that can get into brine shrimp. Now shrimp, healthy shrimp, live at the, uh, uh, in this particular case, um, at the, uh, on, the, on the floor of a lagoon. They're, they're clear in color. They get infected with this uh, particular tapeworm. The tapeworm changes their body colors into pink. The sh shrimp are not social. They, are, they keep well apart from one another. The tapeworm then gets them to be social, but they also float to the surface. So you get rafts of pink shrimp that are easy to see. This is an absolute buffet for these flamingos. So flamingos will feed on the shrimp, ingest the infected shrimp, and the tapeworm will then proceed to finish its biology in the body of the flamingo. Taxoplasmosis is also a parasite. It can get into the nervous systems of rodents. And what happens in the mind of the rodent is suddenly they get, in the coarseness of this, sexually turned on when they smell cat urine. And so basically this mouse or rat will say, honey, here I am. And the cat will obviously clearly take advantage of the situation and kill the rodent and consume it. And then the taxoplasmosis can finish its biology in the cat. That's why women are advised never to change cat litter. All right. The emerald cock, emerald cock uh, roach wasp is also another parasite um, that uses manipulation. It in fact does brain surgery. You know, Doctor takes 15, 20 years to train up to doing brain surgery. This insect uses this egg laying device, seeks a region in the base of the brain of the cockroach, injects it with a tiny uh, um, cocktail, 
and basically disables a portion of the brain where the cockroach can have the will to move in a particular direction. So it can't decide where to go. It hasn't killed the uh, cockroach. And so then this wasp can they lead the cockroach around to wherever it wants to take it. Okay? So what do bed bugs do? They just look at you. I've had 300 pound state troopers leap onto chairs when they've seen a bed bug. You know, these are tiny little flat insects, but they have a psychological hold on us. Okay, now let's get to understand this insect and try and release this hold that people have. It's a flat insect because it's designed to go into cracks and crevices. It's generally oval in shape. It's not invisible. There's a lot of urban myth out there, urban folklore, that the things are invisible. They're too small to see. They're clear to see. They're about the size of an apple seed. They are honey brown. Um, and they have piercing, sucking mouth parts. They don't bite. Night, night, sleep tight. Don't let the bed bugs bite. They don't actually have teeth. They have a perfect little straw. They're very fussy eaters. They're capillary eaters. And they very, are very gentle eaters. Um, they are very ancient insects. No doubt the dinosaurs had problems with them. The early body form of insects was that the nymphs, the immatures, were the same shape but simpler in form as the adults. And all they did was just uh, grow in different stages and develop um, to adults. They're not like the modern insect, like the butterfly, where you have four distinct stages, egg, a caterpillar, pupa, and butterfly. But that honey brown color is an earth tone. It's a ground tone, it's a camouflage. And you can see with the nymphs, like in the bottom right-hand corner, um, that honey brown of those two newly hatched nymphs in their sides, they're almost impossible to see in the, on, on a um, piece of furniture because of they're so small and that, that color is very good at hiding them. It's a camouflage. Females in the top right, you can see are more rounder. And in the bottom left, you can see that the males have a little button on the end, which is basically their wedding tackle. And we'll get to the wedding tackle a little later on. One thing I need you to notice is these dark, dark masses in the lower part of the abdominal tract. These insects are extremely adept at surviving long periods without food. If you get them into low temperatures in the low 40s, they can actually um, survive over a year without feeding. And they depend on this camel pack of concentrated blood from the previous meal, sequestered in the lower intestinal tract to survive through a period of unplanned starvation. They never know when they're going to get their next meal. So the life cycle, if you think of seven, seven days of the week, seven brides for seven brothers, seven is a very strong element in our lives. And it's seven life cycles for the insect, um, or seven stages. We start with the egg. The egg is laid, lightly glued on a structure or substrate by the female. It then takes about eight to 10 days to develop and hatches as a little hungry nymph. The nymph will rest for a couple of days and then seek out a blood meal. It will then take a blood meal in this case, a young lady snoozing on the, on the bed, and then retreat to its refuge, fully en engorged. It will then rest a couple of days, molt, become hungry again, then repeat the cycle. So it will go through five stages of development until it becomes an adult, and then um, the adults mate, and then the females will then produce the eggs. They're not the sharpest knives in the drawer, they basically stay in one location. They will commute to the host and then commute back. They love to hide, as you can see in the top right-hand corner, in um, clusters or refuges. Um, if you're bunched together, there are more eyes to look out for uh, danger. They can also conserve moisture and um, uh, Generally, it, they can create a microhabitat which is comfortable for them to live in. They have extremely repetitive behavior. The, um, and they love habit. The 
nightstand that you see in the bottom right corner is actually an example of a very severely infested apartment and you can see those little black specks that's the fecal material that was ejected from the low intestinal tract prior to feeding or just after feeding bed bugs never will feed or will never defecate on you they're rather polite in that particular issue they will either hold themselves so they get back to their refuge or they will defecate before they leave the fecal material has a lot of chemistry in it and it's a beacon in the dark they when they leave they need to be having some mechanism to be able to return and they use the odors from that fecal material in the refuge to get back in connecticut um, we have three species of bed bugs so it's important um, when an insect is found to verify that it is a bed bug and that it is the correct species we have on the left the eastern bat bug which is fluffy but this is highly magnified to the to an untrained person you would not be able to tell the difference from a bat bug and a human feeding bed bug which is in the center and on the right is a chimney swift bug now many people look at the chimney swift bug saying that it's a little human bed bug you can't tell so when an insect is discovered, the most important thing is to initially get it identified, double check that you actually are dealing with a human feeding bed bug. We have worldwide three species of human feeding bed bugs, um, the common bed bug, the tropical bed bug, and there's another species that trapped, is trapped out in West Africa. The other 90 plus 100 species will be feeding on other animals and creatures around the planet. But bed bugs, is a, it's a catch-all name for this particular family, Cymex. Um, we're going to get into some of the behavior and, and, and reproduction in this next segment. They have what is called thigmotaxis. They're anxious. They're basket cases. And they have a drive, a drive to get into a crack. They have to have something touching the top and the bottom of their bodies. This is called thigmotaxis. And so if you put a bed bug out in the open, it's going to completely freak out. So you will often see the insects gravitating to the tufts of mattresses or into, as you can see in the top right-hand cor corner, a imperfection in a wall. And you can see all the fecal pellets uh, uh, specks on the, um, around that imperfection in the wall. They're also have individual behaviors. I did a breeding program with a population of females and I tracked each female and her um, fecundity as well as her egg laying habits. And um, what I found was every single female would have a unique way of laying her eggs. So you can see on the right series of photographs, the top right um, this female liked to lay her eggs in pairs along the edge of this piece of cardboard. In the center, this female liked to start her clutch um, at the edge and then work her way in. She'd come back during a 24-hour period and add eggs in front. All right? And then in the bottom, you can see that this female liked to do pairs, but she turned the eggs inward to the cardboard and then laid some eggs separate. Now, I began to wonder about this separation behavior. And what I noticed was that even though each female had a fingerprint of egg laying behavior, every single one of them would hide an egg or two during her particular cycle. Now, um, bed bugs cycle, they don't Females don't mate once and then produce um, offspring for the rest of their lives, such as honeybees. She will mate, uh, sorry, she will feed, mate, and then spend a week to 10 days producing eggs until she runs out of energy. Then she will feed, mate, and then do another 10 days, approximately, for egg laying. During that period, she will do a, her, her usual um, habitual egg laying behavior, but always will hide a couple of eggs away. Now, why is that? It's because of predation. If a predator like a cockroach gets into that clutch and destroys it, she's got a couple of insurance policies hidden away. Okay, so the, uh, even if the entire population is killed off, there are eggs hidden away. 
So often when people come in and do treatments, they will say they've got rid of the bed bugs, and then suddenly they start to show up again. It's because of those eggs, those nymphs hatch, and then um, because they've been protected deep in the recesses of the wall or in, the, in an article and haven't been killed, they can then develop into adults. It usually takes about six weeks, and then you've got your population back up and running again. So it's an insurance policy for survival. They are desert insects. And basically, we ran into them during the, the caveman days, uh, primarily in caves where there's cracks and crevices um, in hot areas of the world. They easily survive dry environments. Um, they have extremely good water retention. They're very quiet, so they don't waste energy, and they're very efficient in um, where they move. They don't run around and waste energy. They're very directed in their uh, movement between the refugees and their host. Um, and by clustering um, together, they protect against uh, um, loss of water, and it's a conservation of water effect. The other thing is the sharing of resources. Um, I'm just thinking of uh, vampire bats, for example, who feed on cattle in South America. And uh, often the uh, mothers will regurgitate blood for their young. It's, it's a sharing of resources. Um, bed bugs do the same. Um, the, the image of these two young nymphs, their siblings in the top right hand corner, you see one's full of blood and the other one hasn't. Now, these are very young, they're not particularly strong, and sometimes getting to a host. It's a long trip for them. Um, so this is a little survival mechanism. These young nymphs, um, some of them, will actually feed on engorged older nymphs or adults when they return from feed, foraging. So they can get a meal and they can develop into the next stage and survive. So it's a sharing. So they feed on each other. So you've got a um, a beak, a mouth part of a nymph inserting itself into an older nymph or, or an adult, again, that more elastic exoskeleton would be able to protect against that feeding activity. Okay, I'm going to now show you um, populations and population movement. This is the Harlan line. This is a laboratory line of insects that have been in the laboratories for 40 years. And so they've lost their fear of people, and you'll see what happens. Bustling around, busy little bees. Just very excited about life. They're thinking they're going to get a treat, but they're not going to. But can you see they're very highly active, very energetic little insects. And they're trotting about. And bed bugs, bed bugs can move. They can move a distance very quickly, as you can see. Very, very active. Now, if down in here, this is a wild population. They spend their lives avoiding trouble. Um, they, with this wild population, they will quietly just, one by one, disappear and melt and hide behind uh, under this particular cardboard. In five minutes, they'll be all gone, but you wouldn't notice it. Okay? Um, Bed bugs really do have a bit of a problem because we are a top predator. We are the super predator. And we're very intelligent and we know how to kill them. So they've got these little mechanisms to survive and they're, they're thriving. Um, the, here is also uh, a, a, a shot of a classic refuge and you can see the eggs and the um, fecal material. It seems uh, rather messy, but that's an absolute necessity for survival. And if you look in the top right image, there is a black spot. That's a fecal sp uh, spot on my skin. This insect had been fed ivermectin, um, and it had become ill. It couldn't feed, and it was stressing, and it defecated on my skin. You need to understand that, again, that insects that are sick or highly stressed will defecate on the skin, but normally they will defecate in their refuges if they're healthy. Here is another image um, of protection. They can hide inside exoskeletons. If you look 
in this area where I'm pointing with the little hand, you will see a nymph playing around inside the shed skin of an old, uh, older insect. This insect here is actually a female. She's just sitting quietly and you see a little flicker. You watch. See? She's messing about in there. And you'll see him flickering back again, the antenna moving. There it is. Can you see it? They hide inside exoskeletons. Remember, they have thigmotaxis. And so they have to get inside structures. So you imagine if you're going along with a pesticide spraying away, what do you think is going to happen to that little nymph inside the exoskeleton? It's a perfect bubble of protection. So you may think you have protected and, and killed off insects, but you haven't because of this, again, um, uh, sec uh, secretive behavior that they have. The other th uh, behavior is stacking. Believe it or not, bed bugs have menopause. Both males and females will run out of reproductive energy, um, usually at about four to five months, but they continue to live on. And what I've noticed is that older insects tend to stack on the outside layer of the refuge, protecting sexually active adults and nymphs within. And that's, again, a protection mechanism. They generally don't feed well. They're not particularly active, but they're great for being picked off by cockroaches. So it's, it, they will get eaten, and then the insects within the cluster have time to get away um, or are just protected. They'll freeze and stay put. So it's, again, another little mechanism of survival. Another uh, survival mechanism is pesticide resistance by behavior. The top right shows insects that huddle. They, there was pesticide put on this uh, filter paper. They sensed it and bolted to the side and stayed put for three weeks. Red bugs, if they're feeling threatened, will stay in one place for weeks. Their time frame is entirely different from the time frame that we have. Um, the idiots on the left were trotting all over the pesticide, and you can see they didn't quite make it. So by survival by behavior avoidance, again, is another mechanism. Hitchhiking. If you follow the series of photographs from the top left, uh, central top, to middle right, and then down to the left, you can see a nymph emerging underneath. So, you know, you may have a single insect accidentally introduced to a building, but who's riding underneath? And they, they're, they're clingy little insects. And so you can have an adult um, introduced to a building and with a 50%, 50% sex ratio, that nymph could be a possible opposite sex. And so when it finally matures, um, five weeks later, four weeks later, however, it could be a member of the opposite sex. And so we have the Adam and Eve effect. All right, so you may have one insect, but actually uh, another one tucked under, riding along. Okay, so what happens when bed bugs are found? And this, we're coming towards the closing part of the talk. All right, um, basically, it's a usurping of our free will. We freak out. Okay, we do it to ourselves. We absolutely do it to ourselves. I don't know why. Um, you know, we had a 50-year break of not having bed bugs, but the vehemence and the intensity of people's reactions. I've had... Uh, one case where a woman is in front of me and I said, well, you've got bed bugs. She went into a catatonic state for 10 minutes. She just shut down. It's so severe. Um, when, when people come in, they often uh, talk about um, skin lesions. It's very, very important that you understand that we all will react differently to bed bug feeding. Um, the folklore that bed bugs eat in a straight line, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, is folklore. They are capillary eaters, and we do not have a straight capillary in our bodies. The only time if there is any linear feeding is if they're parked on a cuff or a piece of fabric and they're feeding along the, along the skin. But if they're free range, the bed bugs, it'll be completely random spots. Generally, you'll have an unexplained series of little spots on the skin that become itchy for about uh, a day and then just go away. But you can have a range from, as you can see, a bright red um, patches on the skin to watery welts. 
I have a colleague in New York who, if he get fed on by a bed bug, would be hospitalized. He has such a sensitive, high sensitivity to this insect. So, never depend on a doctor to diagnose bed bugs from skin lesions. As Rick Vetter said in Riverside, it's garbage can diagnosis. And I've had so many misdiagnoses by doctors who clearly said, oh, it's bed bugs, and it wasn't. It was actually a reaction to something else, often an allergy or a drug interaction that somebody had developed. So um, never ever depend on identifying bed bugs from skin lesions. Find the insect. Okay, here's our stigma. This is our rock that we carry and we need to throw it off our shoulders. So basically, when somebody runs into bed bugs, you go through the five stages of uh, acceptance. It's five stages of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and then finally acceptance. Cortisol levels in the bloodstream are very high during this period. It can be prolonged or fairly quick. So often people will not learn. You'll, they'll just default to um, primitive thoughts, and how can I escape? So I could actually be talking to somebody. I said, you know, do you understand what I'm saying? And they say, uh-huh, yep, yep, I understand. Yep, got it. Good. I asked them the next day, can't remember anything. That first memory is gone. So when, whenever you're working with, with bed bugs and people, it's, it, re repetition is extremely important because of the psychological stigma. We shut down. So what should we do about this? Let me ask a question. What are the zebra doing? They are working together, shoulder to shoulder. All eyes and ears are on the cameraman. They're working as a team. They're a prey item, just like those bed bugs in those cracks and crevices. They're working as a team as well to protect against cockroach attack. So when something crawls up like this large pussycat, that zebra on the left, what's that zebra going to do? It's going to alert the other zebra in the herd that there is a lion about to take an attack. And so it will tell the rest of the animals in the herd that we better get out of Dodge real fast. And with that, they bolt. All right, so they're working together. If you don't, this is what's going to happen to you. So what happens when a person finds bed bugs in an apartment complex and they say that they've got bed bugs? What happens to them? What happens to them is that they are stigmatized, they're attacked, you're the problem, you're going to clean it up, it's all your fault, finger pointing. The person is attacked. What they should be treated as is to be thanked. Thank you for telling me. Because now we all can keep an eye open for bed bugs and we can work together to get rid of them. So if you can turn the narrative 180 and actually welcome reports, and I've done this with numerous um, residential institutions, there's never more, there are no more bed bug problems. It's fear of being attacked by your building mates that allows bed bug populations to get out of hand. So, in broad brush, folks, you've got to be educated, and this is what we're doing this, this afternoon. You need to be proactive. You need to keep your eyes open. Work together. Be observant. Communicate and cooperate. It's a completely different dynamic. Obviously, there's rogues and scallywags out there who take full advantage of the bed bug business, and it's a $3 billion business in the United States. Okay, this is a 25B FIFRA pesticide, and we have cinnamon oil and pepper oil, peppermint oil and clove oil and lemongrass and all that stuff. Well, you hit a bed bug with it, I can drown a bed bug in a drop of water. And yes, a direct hit with this stuff would hit, kill a bed bug. But you put it down on the surface, bed bugs will run over it, or they will avoid it. It's not going to kill them. All right, but it's touted as being, you know, a bed bug killing system. Um, and the manufacturers know about this. You know, they are predators themselves. And so this is a manufacturer's logic, and this is how it reads. 
because it is possible, if not probable, that all of the bed bug products on the market have similar records in the field they were designed to address, they fail to achieve the desired result, which is 100% efficacy in situ. In which case, the fact that our formulation does not get 100% kill against the bugs does not necessarily mean that it is a failure. If the commonly used products fail 85% of the time, and we only fail 84% of the time, that will mean ours is the best. The bar is pretty low. This sort of efficacy would explain why the bed bug problem is chronic, and that's not a bad thing for us. That would mean repeat sales as a maintenance item as opposed to a single purchase achieving total eradication. They know what they're doing. So, um, you don't buy over-the-counter pesticides. Most of the pesticides over-the-counter are, in fact, um, the insects are resistant to or they will avoid, and they're not effective. You're just throwing your money away. Oh, here is an example of diatomaceous earth all over the bed. You know, people get killed by bed bug treatment. There's a study where 400 people were identified as being killed from, you know, over-bombing, over-fumigation. And, and using pesticides. If, okay, if one bomb works, let's put nine in them, in a, in a space to kill the bed bugs. Bed bugs in cracks and crevices. Those fumes will not be able to reach those locations. Um, problems also in, in cluttering and downsizing, hoarding. Again, these are crack and object living insects, and so there's plenty of spaces for them to hide, and uh, because they're extremely shy, and with that coloration, if a bed bug dis steps into a, clack, a crack, it totally disappears because that red makes it indivisible in low light. And so we are moving into the mattress situation because bed bugs, you know, like to hang around people. Um, Boston actually, um, with mattress recycling, found out that if you put a sign on a mattress um, saying infested with bed bugs, left it outside to be gone in 10 minutes. But if you cover the mattress with ketchup and say, you know, smear it, it won't get touched. So I think there's a new use for Heinz ketchup. Um, as you can see, also the movement of mattresses, that bottom photograph in the right of somebody sneaking off with a picked up mattress. I caught that little activity and, and followed it in my car and took the photograph. So mattresses are moved around a great deal and many, many not, not many, a number of them can have a problem with bed bugs, not all of them. In the, in the mattress stream, actually, it's a very low, low percent, usually less than 5%. Um, bed bugs can be moved in the second-hand stream. Also, for instance, in vehicles, in um, vans, um, there's often a courtesy um, where somebody who sells new mattresses, they will pick up the old mattress and put it into the truck and then leave. And bed bugs can... In, in anxiety, get off that mattress inside the truck and go into a crack, and then it transfers over to other material. I had a colleague who moved from one city in Connecticut to uh, the New Haven, where she works with me, and she picked up bed bugs in the moving van. So, you know, what do we do? Canine uh, detection is extremely effective. Um, particular breeds, particularly the small hunting dog breeds, their olfactory cells are far more dense. And so they're actually super sniffers. And a good, well-trained dog with a um, good handler um, can pick up one live egg. And they only are trained to pick up on live material. So you can do a treatment and then bring the dogs back in for a check several weeks later. Dogs are very useful in complicated situations, such as um, um, movie theaters, as you can see in the bottom left, or apartment complexes. You can go, they can go through, they can weave through um, many more apartments and rooms and hotel rooms um, much faster than a couple of people. And their noses really do a good job. Um, a good dog will uh, take, cost about $10,000 to train. So these are not, you know, cheap animals. So, um, again, never entertain using over-the-counter pesticides because if you eventually get a dog in, you can actually harm the dog um, with those pesticides. They can't inhale that stuff. 
So um, you remember the night, night, sleep tight, don't let the bed bugs die, bite? If you look, this is Sturbridge Village, and I happen to see this bed. See these uh, strings or ropes? What fo po uh, folks did in the old days was tighten up the roping so they could use the bed at night. So night, night, sleep tight. The tightening up the bed for sleep. But I thought that was kind of cute. Anyway, so this is a mattress um, recycling facility in Bridgeport, and you can see there's a lot of material to get through. And so there are decision points upstream at the collection, the drive and transfer station attendant locations. Um, you, you can, you know, very quickly see if there's bed bugs or bed bug sign on mattresses, just knowing, learning what to look for, and basically send that over to destruction. Or um, if it's clean, then you go to processing. So when you're looking along a mattress, you're looking for the cracks and surfaces. They're not going to be in the open. They'll be along the seams. They'll be huddling. I work with bed bugs. I work with um, pest management professionals who have, are up to their elbows in bed bugs, and we never take them home with us because we understand the insects. They're actually terrified of you. So they will hunker down and hide. So if you're, if you're somebody doing an inspection, you lift up a tuft, you might see a bed bug. It's not going to be running at you. He's going to try and get away from you. So um, you've got to be relaxed over this. So this is a point, collection point. Um, also, when these mattresses enter a plant as well, that's another spot point of inspection. And so you can direct the mattresses across. And again, I keep emphasizing, it's very low number of mattresses. So you're looking for little black clusters of, uh, of fecal material um, or um, the insects themselves, as you can see, tucked along this tuft. This, as I, 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 I said, is, is a heavy population. Normally, it's one or two, three little black specks and maybe an insect and a little shed skin. That's it. Very light. So here are some st suggested strategies at work. Remain calm. This is, these are harmless insects. They're very delicate insects. They're easily killed if you know what they're to do. And they are totally terrified of you. Absolutely apoplectically terrified of you. Preemptive inspection, knowing what to look for. And of course, your vacuum cleaner. Vacuum cleaner is the pesticide of choice. And the crevice tool on the end of the, pest, uh, of the vacuum cleaner hose is by far the best mechanism to pick up and eradicate bed bug populations. And there have been instances where populations have been finished off in space, if they're small, using a vacuum cleaner. What does a vacuum cleaner do? It sucks up those exoskeletons with the nymphs inside, if they're inside. It cleans out the site. Um, it sucks out the adults, but it doesn't it keeps that refuge area intact. Remember the fecal pellets, the fecal material? What happens is that if there are some nymphs hidden away, that refuge will be calling them. So when they hatch, they'll go to that refuge. So you use your crevice tool every 10 days until you got rid of the uh, population. You're going to be picking up those nymphs because they'll gravitate to that refuge. They have a loyalty to the refuge. So this is the choice. So if you're in a um, plant, always have a canister vacuum cleaner around and suck up the bugs. Um, a small spray bottle of soapy water to immobilize the insects, and you can drown them. You can kill them. Um, plastic bottle or Ziploc bag to capture them if you need them for identification. Um, at work, have a change of clothes. If you feel uncomfortable, just jump out of the out, out of clothes. It's very unlikely anything will cling to you because there's too much motion. Um, and also have a, a dryer uh, at, at work or at home. Again, you can throw a set of clothes into the dryer. Insects are killed in 20 minutes in a dryer. You imagine if you were thrown into a dryer at high temperature for 20 minutes, you're not going to come out of that very well. Um, constant training, and this is part of the program that we're doing today. And then always have a person for identification and support so that you can always just recharge the batteries as far as knowledge is concerned. Cymexa is a silica gel that's actually pretty inert and can be used in cracks and crevices. 
judiciously. You don't, you put it in very, very lightly. Also corking cracks and crevices, again, preventing the insects from hiding is also a useful mechanism of integrated pest management control against the insect. At home, just don't panic, okay? Use your vacuum cleaner. Um, do not wash and clean those refuges. Remember, they can be used. Um, that's an Achilles heel for the insect to draw in other insects in the area. Don't use over-the-counter pesticides and work with a family-owned pest management business with a great deal of experience. Okay, generally a number of the national companies tend to have staff move through. Anybody who's good will leave and, and either start their own business or go to other businesses. They kind of start out with national companies. Some people are extremely good at the, in the national companies, but uh, generally the lower level techs are not very well trained and they don't even know how to identify insects. And I've had dozens of experiences where a, a tech has misidentified an insect to dire expense of the client. So um, just be very diligent in selecting your pest management company. Again, proactive behavior such as regular inspections and again, communication. This is some research that I'm doing, and actually I'm working with John Sheely um, at Case Western Reserve in Ohio. We're using ivermectin, which is a, uh, another novel way. Treat the host with a compound that will kill the insects. And so this is a rabbit, radar, because he has massive ears. And we injected him uh, with ivermectin as an initial study and then fed populations of bed bugs on him. And it resulted in... Um, uh, increase, one shot, one, one, one injection, an increase of ivermectin into the bloodstream where it became lethal after about 36 to 48 hours. So it peaked and then it dropped down. And even those insects that were not mortally harmed, many could not feed, many could not reproduce. So it really impacted the population. So we're trying to get now into um, studies using uh, volunteers in, in Ohio, um, but it's not easy because it's using you know, human study subjects. But ivermectin does kill bed bugs. And that's it, ladies and gentlemen. Um, if you wish to get further information, the experiment station uh, in Connecticut does have a website and comprehensive information on that website under the um, portal bed bugs. And then of course we have a lot of fun with cartoons. And uh, we usually have a um, seasonal cartoon at Christmas and Thanksgiving and, and Easter um, highlighting bed bugs. Yeah, we are entomologists. We, you know, we're a little exceptional in society, to say the least. But it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much. And I think we'll be going over to questions. Thank you, Gail. That was great. And uh, being on the uh, bed bug listserv, I can say she really does send out holiday cards. And uh, some of them make you laugh, and some of them do make you cringe a little bit. Um, <laughs> So thank you. So if people do have questions, please uh, type them into the group chat box. That would be very helpful. We do have a couple of questions to get us started. Um, the first one is, can bed bugs jump or fly, such as jumping into or onto your luggage while in a hotel? Uh, no, they, they trot along. They cannot jump. They don't have the mechanism in their legs to be able to do that like fleas. So that's, again, folklore then they have no wings. Um, actually, they have wing pads. If you look actually at the Macy's Day balloon, um, and I think you can see in the illustration, it is biologically correct. This here, where the arrow is, are wing pads. Um, it's like an appendix. It's completely useless. So in, the bed bugs cannot fly. So I'm just going to add my own question to the end since we mentioned hotels because everybody always asks this question eventually is how do you protect yourself or what do you do before you go into a hotel? What I do is actually uh, as I check in I take a note of the clerk's name, the name tab. I then also take a mental note of the time I checked in. Um, there, are, there is actually a law that's not known that if a employee has been instructed by the hotel to deny the fact that they have bed bugs and then you pick up bed bugs from that hotel, the hotel is on the hook for paying to correct the problem of bed bugs in your home. That's little known. Um, what I do is put my luggage into the bathtub, never leave it in the hall, somebody may just wander off with it, and then I inspect around the bed and I'm looking for those little black specks. 
Um, also check the ceiling, um, particularly around the fire um, alarm and sensors because they will cluster in that area, also up on the curtains. I am finding more and more that bed bug populations in hotels are up and high. They, they've been basically cleared out lower down by the staff because people have seen it, but people are not looking up into those popcorn ceilings. So look for the insects in the ceilings and in nooks and crannies around the furniture. Never unpack your luggage in a hotel. Always keep it in the suitcase and the suitcase sealed on one of those luggage racks or in, in, the, um, in the closet that's provided. Um, you can hang some light clothes on the rails in the shower if you wish, if you want clothing to hang, hang down. Um, but don't get over paranoid. The hotels have really got their act together now. And um, there's fewer and fewer bed bug issues in the hotels. Great, thanks. So when handling old bedding after delivering new bedding, Will the drivers likely take home some bed bugs on their clothing as a result of handling? Yeah, that's a continuous uh, uh, concern. What you should do is examine the mattresses first and double check. It's very unlikely you will bring them home. If you feel uncomfortable about a particular mattress, um, what you should do is have a change of clothes set up in the garage. And so when you get home, drop your outer uh, uh, clothes um, and then change into the fresh clothes and put those outer clothes into a, a plastic bag and put them into the dryer for 20 minutes. And that's the end of the bed box. So I think the question was about getting a new bed, but you're really talking about transfer station attendants that um, if they are in a town where they have to handle the, mm -hmm. the mattress and actually bring it into um, maybe the roll off of, or something, and that if they're comfortable, they should change before going into the home. Is yes, that correct? Yes, just change. Okay. Yeah, that's what a lot of pest management professionals will do. If they're uncomfortable, they've been, a, you know, working a, a very infested site, they will switch out of their clothes just as a precaution. Uh, bed bugs are surface insects, and crack and crevice, they'll slip in under, you know, a cuff or a seam. So if you take those clothes out, they will not be on the undergarments. They're just, they're just, uh, they're going to find the first place they can hide. They're not going to be sniffing around. Not like ticks that can get in your clothing and go up inside. Um, bed bugs are not like that. They're very, very timid. So we have a question about killing them with heat. Does heat kill them like mass heating of trailers and spaces? Yes. Yeah, heating. Um, bed bugs of um, most insects are extraordinarily sensitive to heat. Remember, they are very delicate. Um, you can kill all stages at 113 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, that's eggs, nymphs, and adults in four minutes. That goes down to a minute when you're over 120. Now, 113, you can pick that up in, in Las Vegas. So in, in, um, in containers, particularly in the summer, if they're closed down, those temperatures are going to go very high in those containers. Bed bugs are going to die. They're also uh, not particularly um, comfortable in cold either. Cold winter temperatures can kill them. And I did a study um, uh, with um, fed and unfed populations on the couch I put on my back deck. You know, science can be very straightforward. And I did my best to keep those things alive in one of these uh, polar vortexes that came down over Connecticut a couple of years ago. I cut, buried them in cushions. You know, I did everything I could. None of them survived. You know, if you're a bed bug at 70, who's had a comfortable life at 70 degrees, which is comfortable for us, we, they match our desire for temperature. If you, you know, they don't have little sweaters to put on. You put a bed bug down to 10 degrees, it's going to die. So, and, and so higher temperatures. Um, and they're, you know, even at 106, they can stress out and their internal organisms in their guts can stress out. So they actually can't digest food properly. So they, are, they get stressed. In fact, Bed bugs will um, die at high humidity. Remember, they are delicate. So this is connecting a little bit with um, the issue of the clothing. That um, how about the tread on the sole of a shoe? And this, I'm, I'm assuming they're asking, can bed bugs travel on your clothing, including shoes? Unlikely, because we're moving around so much. A bed bug is going to seek shelter. It's going to hide. It's sigmotaxic. That's a, that is wired, hot wired into their DNA. They want to flee from you. The only time 
you're going to have a problem with the bed bug is, is if it's accidentally moved or ran into something um, like a shoe and you uh, picked it up and put it on and, and walked out of a room with it. So again, observation, just check. If you know what a bed bug looks like, you'll see it, just pick it up in a tissue and flush it down the toilet. It's not, just treat it like in any other insect. In terms of transportation and trucks, both for new old, new and old bedding and perhaps even rentals, should trucks carry a can of alpine bed lamb or such just in case they feel they may have been in contact with bed bugs? No. And why not? <laughs> um, because it, you, can, you, can, you can carry a bottle of soapy water. You don't need any of these over-the-counter pesticides. It's, it smells nice, makes us feel good. But a, a small bottle of soapy water would be perfectly fine. Bed bugs would drown. Would you vacuum out a rental vehicle before you use it? No. No, the instance of bed bugs in rental vehicles is remarkably low, even though I showed you that example. That's one example. And millions of vehicles are being rented, you know, over a period of a month. So the chances are, the probability is like probably being hit by lightning. I, I wouldn't worry about that. So we're going back to the freezing temperature. Mm. How cold does it need to be and for how long? <laughs> You can use the family refrigerator. Um, and if you have a delicate item like a book or, or an electronic piece, you've got to double check with the manufacturer, particularly with electronic items. You can put them into the refrigerator and, and um, drop the temperature down, keep them in that um, at 20 degrees for about a week, and that should do them. Because they, they, will, they will just collapse under the cold. Any colder than that, they're going to actually be killed very quickly. So this is just a story of myself. I went to Italy and we got bed bugs. And luckily I had taken Gail's workshop so many times and we did not panic, but uh, everything we threw in the dryer that we could and anything we couldn't, we were lucky enough that we had a chest freezer. Mm. We just put everything in plastic bags and popped it in the freezer and all was good. All was good, yeah. Yeah. We didn't panic. Yeah. No panicking and you'd be Are fine. Are there any questions in the audience? No. You guys are so knowledgeable, scratching, itching. Yeah. It's, yes. It's a are there any more subject? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> are there any more questions um, from folks online? And if you have a question, now is the time to um, type something in the group chat box. Oh, we've got a couple more questions. Would sealing old mattresses inside of plastic bags be the best way to transfer mattresses? Nope. Good observation. The only time you should seal it is if that mattress is fouled, you know, from material that people shed, you know, and um, are, are basically dirty. Um, but, you know, it's again observation. Careful observation is the, is the ticket to protection. And the vacuum is your friend. And the vacuum cleaner and this little baby here is your friend. Great. So if there's no other questions, um, if there's a few folks that thanked you online, I thank you as well. Great presentation. And if you have any follow-up questions, I would say start with uh, Kate Caddy first with the Mattress Recycling Council. And again, thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you.